Is the creation engine holding Bethesda and Starfield back? Yeah, that's a pretty loaded question, and this has been a debate that I've seen happen online for a really, really, really long time. And I've kind of seen the many different sides of it, right? You see a lot of people look at the new games and think, oh, wow, look at those. Look at Red Dead Redemption 2. Look at those characters' faces and that detail. And then, or even, you know, other, other like, modern games, contemporaries that are that are coming out right now. Um, even to take a look at some of the, you know, the, the facial animation performances that are going on in a game like Baldur's Gate 3. Um, and people are like, oh yeah, Larry, an independent studio making Baldur's Gate 3. Then they take a look at Starfield NPCs talking. Turns out there's, like, some sort of uh, muscle that uh, they don't move to basically make their eyes slightly squint whenever they smile. And apparently that's the reason why the smiles, particularly in Starfield, Starfields penetrate your soul and make you feel deeply, uh, you know, ill at ease. Yeah, I don't know, man. Bethesda faces. I suppose they'll always be a thing. This has been a very heated topic, though, and the big problem here is an engine is one thing in the heads of those who play games and don't have a technical background, and in the heads of people who do make games and do have a technical background, an engine is uh, another thing. But what very often happens is one group of people kind of bashes the other one from not knowing, right? Now, I'm going to contend that it's not your job to know what a game engine is. If we're raising the bar of participating in games discourse to the point where a fan of a game is like, these faces look bad, why does it feel janky? Why does that look mid? And someone's like, you just don't understand game engines. Or maybe somebody's like, this doesn't look good to me. Oh, creation engine, shit, hate it. And it's like, is that the most nuanced take on the creation engine? No, it's not. Is it how that person feels? Like, yes, it is. Is there truth in what they're saying? Yes. The fact that they're not perfectly, you know, on target when they are talking about a specialized thing in a field that they're not in, that's like a crazy thing to start bashing people for. The amount of like, you don't fully understand what a game engine is. Be gone, peasant. The amount of that that you see from some of the press, stuff like that, I think it kind of sucks. But I do actually want to engage in the topic. And that's... Yeah, what we're going to be doing uh, today. It's funny, because, you know, these days, it's as if on the internet, you know, everyone is expected to be an absolute expert uh, on everything, and if they're not, they'll be laughed at. And that's actually really bad for um, our levels of understanding, the quality of discourse. So what I'm going to try to do is to break a few things down, make it super simple, and then we're just going to walk through things to see what's going on with the creation engine and how creation engine is the reason why Starfield exists and it's also the reason why Starfield exists. Oh, yeah. Got quite a lot of things to share. There's a side that you didn't see over the last few years, and therapy is a large part of how I've kept going. So today's advert, BetterHelp, feels very natural to me. They're using technology to make therapy accessible to people, right? So you sign up, you fill out a questionnaire, and then they'll match you with a credentialed professional in as little as a few days. And if you feel like, um, you know, another therapist would be a better fit, well, you can just switch at no additional cost. Now, on my side of things, um, I ended up with a chronic pain condition as of three years ago. Uh, some nerves are not happy, and uh, they are not happy all day. <laughs> so the last three years, especially getting to sleep, that has been um, really hard, especially back when we didn't actually know what the problem was. Um, so from that point, uh, therapy entered my life, and uh, from the initial relief of just being able to talk about how things felt without burdening somebody that I know, or wasting the very small amount of time that you end up getting with a doctor, and um, that was big. And beyond that, then, helping build the, the mental tools that now let me essentially live with my situation, um, really like I did in the past, and have my function back. And that's just how it turned things around for me. The format of BetterHelp is important too. Be it audio, video call, or even messaging, they will fit how you feel most comfortable. So if you're going through a hard time, they're a fantastic option. And you can visit my link, which is betterhelp.com forward slash bellular. Clicking that will, of course, uh, directly support the channel. It also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so they can connect you with a therapist to see if it helps. Uh, there is a real power to talking to somebody. I now very much know that through experience, getting thoughts out of your head, that can really just make the biggest difference. So thanks to BetterHelp for supporting the show. You can find their links down below. With that said, let's get stuck into the video. So imagine, right, there's the core of the engine. 
something that happened since I wrote my outline for today's video is, uh, you know, the Unity runtime, you know, the way they want to charge uh, for every install of that. Imagine that's the core, right? This special black box. It's full of demon magic. Nobody knows how it works, but there it is, and it's doing things. So that's the very core of your engine. Then, you know, think of, uh, I just want to say modules. Big systems that exist on your engine. These are going to be things like, you know, your renderer how your sound is done, your animation system, for it to go way back in time, you know, is it a is it a deferred renderer or not? All of these things, all the kind of nuts and bolts of how those things work that are there in a rather generic sense, right? You know, oh, yep, you use Unity, you've got the physically based renderer. Okay. And then we're just going to have what I'm going to call plugins and tools. And that might be a little tool that you make to make just a little bit of your game creation process be a little bit easier. Maybe you want some more procedural generation tools for terrain so that your developers can make terrain faster. Well, you build your little terrain system. There you go. You plug it in. A really good example for our game, the the Pale Beyond. Uh, the words in this game are all written in something called Inkle, right? Of course, we're using, we were using Unity as the game engine. We had to make those things talk to each other. We also had this little system developed called Instructions that allowed us to do some very cool and handy things. That's kind of what I'd say as an example of a plugin, right? It's a tool that you can make to help you do your job using this game engine. And often, it's actually less the core game engine that gives you the features that you see um, on the game, and it's far more iterations on modules and like little plugins and tools for the engine that allows the developer to, in that engine, build the new feature or just make content more efficiently, right? When you look at Unity and Unreal, I think Unity's got 3,000 engine developers. Unreal, of course, you know, they're very concerned about their core and their modules, right? Because if you're a development team, like we were with Pale, you need to make a bunch of custom things that will exist on top of Unity that will allow you to do all of the things that, as an example, we wanted to do to make our game that, who knows what page this is on, but our game that looks vaguely like this, right? Now, if you're making another type of game in Unity, well, you're going to make different little plugins, different tools. Maybe you'll grab different things from the asset store. And when I say asset store, you might be thinking grabbing a bunch of trees from it. No, asset store could be something like save load system. It could be a, a, a particular shader that you like the look of. Okay, so these companies are engine development companies. Their thing is they make their engine really damn good. But also with that, do make their engine be capable of doing a lot of things, potentially including things you might not even need for your game. So you may just lose a little bit of efficiency in using one of those off the shelf engines, right? Now, some very large companies can get what's called like a source code license, which will let them really just dive into the guts of Unreal and make all of the super custom things that they want. So, when you use an off-the-shelf engine, what do you get? You get modularity, you get flexibility. Unity, Unreal, um, you know, they've managed to sell to so many different studios, and that means that they will have a real good focus on the core of their product and that flexibility. Maybe more so in Unity than Unreal. I think Unreal's definitely more of like a, you know, 3D kind of AAA looking, AA looking game thing. But you might then say, what about in-house engines? And this is where I'm going to bring up a really hilarious thing. Um, legacy support. Did you know, um, just, it's crazy, but so much of the global banking system runs on a very old programming language called COBOL. Um, yes, quite, quite odd. Ever wondered for your Windows user why there's like multiple versions of the control panel in your computer? A lot of that's like legacy support from way back in the day. Um, so what happens? You know, your Windows, you want to make Windows 11, but you got to support a bunch of features from ages ago because you got all this legacy code. And that's kind of going to be my bridge into, in a way, the strengths and the weaknesses of doing your own custom in-house engine. So this, if you're an engineer, this is what you want. I mean, if you're an engine engineer, uh, right? You just get to sit down there and make some incredible software. And what this means is you get to make an engine specifically for the game that you're building. You don't have to worry about that flexibility as much, the modularity as much. You gotta make the perfect engine for that game. I'm gonna give you two examples. One of them is, is Overwatch. Now this one I kind of know because some Overwatch, uh, you know, I had one Overwatch uh, team league. I also, more importantly though for this, had an Overwatch esports person uh, sort of fill me in and some of the behind the scenes stuff. So if you were there in and around Overwatch League season one, you would have noticed that they had awful spectator tools. This will become relevant later, but when it came out, Overwatch 
ran amazingly, fell oh, smooth as butter, right? Look at Battlefield 3. Were we not all rather wowed by Battle 3 when that came out? Like, that really was pushing things forward. It was so impressive, and I think it was Frostbite 2 that was doing that. And of course, this makes sense, because DICE made Frostbite to make Battlefield games. Now, here we see fantastic strengths. Battlefield, impressive for its time. Overwatch, impressive for its time. Both games, custom engines, very, very cool. But what happens when you're using a custom engine now your scope changes. What happens if, say, the Bobster himself, Mr. Kotick, pushes for the Overwatch League? Well, did you know that the Overwatch League suffered massively from awful spectator tools? And here's the problem. It was really hard and it took loads of time to make esports quality spectator tools for Overwatch. Because Overwatch was his own custom engine. It was made to do Overwatch, the game that came out, right? And that was a pain in the ass for them. Loads of the work that, uh, loads of the work that was taking Overwatch 1 into, you know that game that didn't come out, Overwatch 2? I'm still waiting on it. Loads of that would have been because Overwatch 2 had a far larger scope than Overwatch 1. The engine needed to do new tricks, right? Um, and then, of course, what happens when, you know, your electronic arts, I think this is the era of John Riccatello. Okay, I double checked. It is the era of John Riccatello, current CEO of Unity, who is, um, you know, having a bit of drama right now. So what happens, right? Mass Effect comes out. Mass Effect 2 comes out. You then um, want money now and line go up, so you make Mass Effect 3 come out within 18 months, meaning that Mass Effect 3 isn't as good as it could be. And then you're like, oh man, we've got all these Dragon Age games coming out. I, we need a new Mass Effect. Mass Effect's printing the money. But I don't want to pay 5 or 10% to Unreal. Ugh. Look at the Swedes over there at DICE. They've made this thing called Frostbite. <laughs> make your Mass Effect Andromeda on Frostbite. Make Dragon Age Inquisition on Frostbite. Make Anthem, because now you're making a live service game, on Frostbite. Frostbite is an awesome engine. Used incorrectly, what we have in our hands is an absolute unmitigated disaster because it was a massive change of scope. Frostbite was being made to do things that Frostbite just couldn't do. And of course, it's a custom engine. It's not like any old, experienced game developer from another company is going to exactly know how to use Frostbite or be super proficient. So basically, here's the TLDR, right? Custom engines, you build them for a purpose. They'll be amazing at that purpose, but you could have to contend with some technical debt because maybe for your next game, if it's to use that engine, your scope will change. Another good example of this, why are CD Projekt Red, after the fun experience they had with Cyberpunk 2077, uh, not using Red Engine again? because the new Cyberpunk and Witcher games are in Unreal Engine 5. Because Red Engine, it took them real far and it did some really impressive things, but it kind of ran aground in like editor tools and stuff that would lead to bugs and all of those things that contributed to Cyberpunk 2077 not being the clear win that we also desperately wanted. Now, imagine this, you have a team of 300 people, you're moving to a new project, your engineers, don't know the scope of the new game design because it's still in pre-production. You've got a warehouse full of artists and designers with not that much to do. How do you use all these resources? And that's kind of how you end in all of these, you know, Overwatch 2 shit show situations, Anthem situations where humongous amounts of work and prototyping is just thrown straight out of the window. So you can see here the pros and the cons of rolling with your own engine. Mass Effect Andromeda suffered terribly. Everything Bioware did suffered terribly. Yada, yada, yada. We all kind of know the story and that means it's Bethesda the time. This is the spicy bit. Okay. In 1997, Numerical Design Limited released the Netimerse engine. Bethesda Game Studios, who were looking to evolve from the in-house X engine, uh, funny sort of wording, um, which is their, their own engine, uh, they wanted to move away from that. So they decided to license Netmerse, and they used it to build Morrowind. And that how is, is how they moved from like Elder Scrolls Arena, Elder Scrolls, um, you know, Daggerfall, etc., into Morrowind. And that engine would evolve into Gamebryo. And uh, yeah, Gamebryo would, uh, would basically power Morrowind, Oblivion, and Fallout 3. But then Gamebryo, like, oh, was kind of showing its age. They kind of knew a new console generation would be coming up. They want to do cool new things with Skyrim. So what do they do? Well, they forked their Fallout 3 version of Gamebryo. Now, I didn't say they forked Gamebryo. 
they forked their Fallout 3 version. And I say that very specifically because any developer will add a humongous stack of their own in-house tools and technology on top of whatever engine they're using to build the game. And as an example, right, even for us, even for a basic game like ours, you know, okay, so here's, here's Captain Hunt looking a little bit rough. There he is. Now, we need to place him on the screen. How do we do that? Well, we build a custom staging system that just handles a bunch of shit for us. And it's a great development tool that lets us make that content a bit faster. You know, we have a custom implementation of FMOD that's able to talk to our various different things. The script, which we do uh, in Inkle, Inkle being this, it's almost like a writing language for people who are also programmers. It lets you do some really cool things in the narrative game space. But we had to get it to talk with our build of, you know, with, with our stuff we were doing in Unity. And we wanted to make a bunch of tools to help us debug and help us do things with the script. So we have this system called Instruction. It's a shitload of code, shitload of custom stuff. The only version of Unity exists in is the one that uh, we have because we built it on top of that. These are the kind of tools that actually help you make the game on top of the engine. So even for a simple game like ours, there's a hell of a lot. You can imagine then if you're moving from Morrowind into Oblivion, into Fallout, can you imagine the amount of custom stuff and obviously, like any good code base, it was probably a total shit show because, I mean, if you're a programmer, you know how it is. It's the way that it goes. Um, now, this means that by the time they'd made Fallout 3, that was the most advanced version of the Gamebryo engine that they had. They made all the, all the tools, all the tech. And from that, to build the Elder Scrolls Skyrim, the creation engine is born. Now, I have a question. Is the creation engine Gamebryo? Ship of Theseus, right? Keeps on changing. And here's a fun example. Take Star Citizen. You see a spot on a planet, you can go to it, right? The level of precision in that is uh, is insane. The amount of uh, just incredible streaming and stuff that they're able to do to actually make a, a, a simulation that detailed run at such a scale. Yes, it has bugs. There are a lot of other issues with Star Citizen. Those are kind of beside the point for now, but certainly, a lot of the things that people sort of wish they could do in Starfield, you can do in Star Citizen. To do that, they built it in CryEngine, then Lumberyard, then they for or whatever it was, um, Amazon actually got really pissy about it and there's a whole thing going on. But um, a really good example was like CryEngine was 32-bit. They needed 64-bit precision, so they had to rip a whole bunch of that out and just rebuild it. So the creation engine is the Gamebryo engine, but it also isn't because all of these things change. Id Tech 3 built Call of Duty 1. That then morphed into the IW engine, Infinity Ward, right? Um, Still quite id tech, but they built a shitload of stuff and they kept on iterating that. If you just look at Wikipedia with the various different versions of the Infinity Ward engine, you can see that uh, that genealogy, you can see how it kind of runs straight back up the years as they keep on building stuff and building stuff. And, you know, eventually you've built so many things, you've ripped out the core, built a totally new thing that it's absolutely a ship of Theseus-like uh, situation. So to go to the creation engine then, Todd and his team needed more bells and whistles. The creation engine project then basically involves turning their Fallout 3 fork of Gamebryo into this new thing with sort of new headline features called the creation engine. And then the creation engine evolves, right? If you compare Fallout 76 to Fallout 4, you see big changes. They have a lot of new procedural generation tech. They have new global lighting that is way, way, way better. And uh, of course though, Still, at the time of Fallout 76, it was clear to everybody that cracks were showing. Now, of course there were cracks, because you look at Unity and Unreal, massive corporations with humongous technology teams, you know, like Unity of 3,000 people working in the engine. Todd doesn't have that many working in the creation engine. That's definitely a false comparison, by the way. I'm not making that as a serious point. Uh, kind of more of a jest. But anyway... Um, you know, the, they don't have as much. Now, the tech people at Bethesda are not bad, but what they have to do is they have to focus on the features that will enable their gameplay designers to make content for the players. And every coder will have nice-to-haves, things they wish they could rewrite, technical debt they wish they could squash. I am sure there are coders there who, you know, they were thinking about modern save load technology. Um, you know, they probably thought, oh, if we really put our, you know, put our effort into that, 
We could probably do that. We could we could probably make it so that if a player runs in what four kilometers or three kilometers in this direction, then more of the world just spawns, and you don't have a load screen that forces you to jump back to the planetary view, where you can move your thing over to the side and then jump back down into the planet. Now, of course, while that would have been technically cool in the way that it is very impressive that you can just fly anywhere on a planet in Star Citizen, think about the design of Starfield. It is more of a content-based Bethesda game than it is a roaming about the place and seeing what happens Bethesda game, which I believe, um, I think it was a recent PC Gamer article actually, did a really good job of explaining the different kind of modes of Bethesda play and how Starfield is very focused on do content rather than roam about the place and see what happens. I enjoy it sort of for the content, but to me it's inferior to other Bethesda games because it doesn't have that kind of whole cohesive and immersive experience. But anyhow, you can totally see how any of the technical issues that you could have with Starfield, those coders could have gotten around those if they had the time, if they had the budget. But instead, think about the sorts of things that Todd and team say when they talk about the creation engine. They're primarily focused on tools that lead to immediate player facing things. As an example, procedural generation tech to allow for the back of the box feature of there being like what, a thousand, I think like a thousand planets and a hundred you can visit or whatever it is. The, the global lighting that makes uh, the Starfield Okay, so in a game like Starfield, you know the way you got your randomly generated crowd characters uh, or just kind of like, you know, random components. And then you've got like your full, you know, proper like A-list characters. I mean, you look at some of those A-list characters with really nice lighting, especially indoors, and it can look quite fantastic. It looks great in a screenshot, it looks great in an E3 presentation or whatever, because they've focused on building the lighting system, a player facing system. Now, of course, you know, don't tell them that the second you go outside and everything becomes very flatly lit, that all the characters start to look really bad. But anyway, you can see how a lot of that creation engine development went into things that are directly sellable to players. They didn't go into other things, things that perhaps could have led to having a game that had less Bethesda jank. If we're going to ask, like, why is Baldur's Gate 3 so good? And then you think about the evolutions of their technology and how they've continually refined things and they've been making games of the same genre for ages. You're like, why is a Bethesda game a Bethesda game? You think about the inputs that go into that situation. So when you take a look at things, then new gameplay mechanics, ship building, object placement, new weather systems, better land generation, base building features. This is all stuff you're going to need to be, uh, you know, supporting. Even just simple things like whenever you're putting all the different modules of your spaceship together, how does it align them so that you can walk through all the doors? Because there's a system that does that and someone will have had to have programmed that system. Yet, sometimes you do need to work on the basics. That much is very apparent. Here's a really good example. Skyrim base edition mods suffered, right? Because of how threaded the game was and the limitations on PC resources it could access. Skyrim special edition though uh, is 64 bit. It can use more than four gigabytes of RAM. And as soon as that RAM limitation was lifted off, modders were able to go even more wild than they had previously dreamed with Skyrim mods which is why Skyrim can look so goddamn crazy today. So ultimately then to kind of go through to the very top of this is the creation engine holding Bethesda back. The creation engine is why Bethesda was able to make that sheer quantity of content. While they probably did have, you know, a few years of pre-production or like a year or two, whatever, um, before this game came out, um, because I believe the discussion kind of, you know, this is going from like Todd to the guy who had been greenlighting the thing. I think that was 2013. And you might think like Todd had that conversation with, um, I've, I've forgotten his name, co-founder of ZeniMax. But I remember Todd, uh, he spoke about how uh, he went into his office and I think it was the year 2013, right? And to a lot of us, we see that and we're like, a decade, sorry, a decade. And the characters look like that. And you do get rather surprised. Yes, that is not the amount of time it took to build this game. Here's a little bit of the timeline, right? If you actually go here in the Wikipedia, you see, um, you know, cited things here saying that active development of the game has been ongoing since around the release of Fallout 4 in 2015. By mid-2018, the game was in production, had already been in development for some time, and was in a playable state. You might start to get confused because, let me move over here to um, the recent letter that was, uh, you know, found from, from Todd. Howard notes that, quote, the core development was from 2020 to 2023, saw enormous changes in our lives, a global pandemic, Robert's passing and becoming part of Xbox. Core development. So how can something be in development for some time and in a playable state, 
by mid-2018, but core development B from 2020 to 2023? There's a few different answers. I think one of those, very obviously, uh, is gonna be Fallout 76, right? Which of course came out, uh, funny enough, in 2018. So it's an interesting situation, ultimately, right? This bit here, whenever Todd says core development, that will be meaning the full allocation of resources to that game, right? So that means all the designers, all the artists, because you can have your designs for the game, you as the game director and, you know, your, your core gameplay team, you could have worked out loads of the skills, you could have even play tested a bunch of this, looked at all your different prototypes, but at some point you hit your pre-production lock, you're like, this is the game design document, which will, you know, probably change a lot as development goes on, but there's a certain point in time where you have to, you know, you go to the start line and you pull the trigger. And from that point, 300 motherfuckers are working on your game. And what the creation engine did, provide the tools to allow those 300 people to make that sheer quantity of handcrafted content from 2020 to 2023. And for that probably means they have some nice tools that they've made for the creation engine. But a lot of the other things, well, that's where I start to wonder yeah, I do think playing Fallout 76 in a way that the creation engine is holding them back. Right now, like, it, look, if, if if they were to say, okay, we're going to do creation engine three, and if they had revamped their facial animation technology, they had changed some of their save load systems and, you know, done a few other things like that, there could be a time where everything could look and feel exactly how you'd want it to, and you wouldn't even think about the creation engine. And this, I think, is my final point for today's video, and that is that Starfield is a game that wears its artifice on its sleeve. One could even say that the New Game Plus kind of does that, but it truly does, because where Star Citizen constantly says, I am a simulation, if you want to take a box of goods from this planet to that planet, you are going to pick that up with your character. You're going to ensure you put your helmet on, put your space suit on. You're going to walk that out to your spaceship. But first, you'll have had to go to the friggin' gate and use the little control pad to get your spaceship into the landing pad. Then you'll walk to the landing pad. You'll set the item down in your cargo hold. You'll sit into your chair. You'll spool your ship up. You'll point in the right direction. You'll use your boost frame shift drive, whatever it's called. And uh, you'll wait for 10 minutes because that's how long it takes to get there. But your ship, God damn it, it will fly through that space. And if you even want to pick a random dot on a random planet and meet your friend for a salacious private ERP session, you can, because guess what? If you both go to that same spot on that same planet, it will be the same thing because that planet is real. It is physical. There is no artifice. Starfield doesn't do that. And Starfield doesn't have the sorts of uh, asset streaming, you know? the sorts of asset streaming that exist in Star Citizen. And that means that Starfield says, here's a loading screen, and here's the thing. Spider-Man, PS4, what happens? They make a whole animation thingy to cover the loading screens where, uh, you know, like Peter sits down in the subway. And what happens to the save load system in the new games? Boom, he's there. Boom, you've, you've fast traveled. What Starfield does, of course, is not that. It makes you do a fast travel, and then a fast travel, and then a fast travel, and then a fast travel, all giving you load screen, load screen, load screen, load screen. And that feels a lot, even though it's very quick to get to your destination, that feels a lot more antiquated than moving there slowly, but moving there completely in reality in something like Star Citizen. And that is why Starfield, more than any other Bethesda game, is showing the artifice and it is making the player actually think about the construction of the world. Because when you look at Skyrim, other than yes, going in and out of a town, if you can deal with that load screen in and out of a town, you'll kind of broadly be okay. In uh, the equivalent of that though, in Starfield could be fast traveling from where you are in a city to your ship, fast traveling to the planetary system, then going to the place in the planet, then fast traveling to that with load screen, load screen, load screen, load screen, which constantly says, I'm a piece of software, I'm a piece of software, I'm a piece of software, I'm a piece of software. In Skyrim, you can roam around the place for a long ass time and not see a load screen. In Starfield, you roam around, there's nothing to see because it's procedurally generated. So you don't want to do that. So you barrel through content. You barrel through content by traveling around the Starfield, which gives you trillions of load screens. So. Is the creation engine holding them back? Yes. Also, 
has their game design focused on their weaknesses more than it has in the past? Yes. It's not just the creation engine that is holding them back. And to me, the prospect of The Elder Scrolls VI being the creation engine is not particularly scary because the only thing they'd really need to do in my mind is maybe remove a loading screen when you go into a town. You know, that's already possible on Skyrim and PC, so you can probably do that. There you go. That, that's the situation. It is a mixture of technology, production pipeline, what the company values, and uh, the design decisions interfacing with their technology in such a way that their weaknesses are emphasized and we are in a landscape of defeat in detail. Uh, if you do a few things that are a bit memeable, that meme will spread. Just like all the very derpy faces, you know, my face is tired from Mass Effect Andromeda. I hope this has been a, an interesting talk. Um, I, I like any opportunity to talk about this sort of thing. Uh, like my background, um, I don't really work in engine stuff uh, anymore. Back in university, um, it was a games programming course. But like my final project, like as far as that got, was me writing a renderer uh, for um, uh, just a render for like a little solar system generation thing. It was quite fun. I found myself, um, and I suppose it's why Creation Engine and that stuff's quite fun to me, um, because I found myself uh, looking at a lot of like even Notch's, uh, Notch's code for terrain generation in, um, in, uh, in Minecraft. A lot of fucking about with Pearl and Noise, which, uh, hey, if you've done a similar thing, you will know that we do love our Pearl and Noise and various other derivatives and follow-ups, etc. Um, so that's kind of like my uh, side of things. I was always a little bit more interested in making like, ooh, the cool tool, ooh, the cool system, than I was the like, uh, you know, super crazy stuff. Um, one of my friends works at a AAA studio and there are some turbo pro programmers that he knows and uh, he'll just share with me like little things they do in a hackathon. And to me, it's just like, th this is literal magic. You'll break the simulation if you program any harder, my dude. Um, so, you know, I'm not some like super hardcore engine guy. I've just like had a little bit of a, you know, toe dipped in that and then just working in Unity. But um, I don't know, I suppose you, you go through it enough times um, that you can certainly, you can see how things um, just mesh together to create a perception. What do you think? And uh, if they could solve the loading screen problem, would Creation Engine 2 be in your mind as much? That's my parting question. That's it for me. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.